Well, hello everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of Tui Snyder's Offbeat and Overlooked. This is a weekly streaming show, and it's where I interview a variety of experts about all sorts of things, including cemetery symbols, forgotten history, folklore, quirky travel destinations, sometimes Bigfoot, you never know, all sorts of things. Basically, all the offbeat and overlooked people, places, and things that tickle my fancy, and I have a very ticklish fancy. So, in case you're new here, I'm Tui Snyder. I write books, I give talks, I do a lot of research, and I also do these live streams, obviously. I love sharing what I find with you guys, and it's been so much fun. Um, now, this week's guest let me, is going to be Jeff Morrison. He lives in Detroit, and he is a photographer and art historian. He made this incredibly beautiful, gorgeous coffee table book featuring gargoyles and grotesques and throughout Detroit. Uh, I will be showing it to you a little bit later, and obviously we will be talking to him. So it's going to be really exciting. Of course, I have a couple announcements before we get into that. So make sure you stick around. You see, we're getting a few viewers now. So I know it always people kind of trickle in a little bit here. I want to remind you guys once again that I do have a replay page that has recaps and replays. Uh, every week after the show, I get messages on Facebook or even through my newsletter. And people say, hey, I'm sorry I missed your show. Uh, how do I see the replay? And basically, you could just go to my recap and replay page. It's on my website, which is just my weird name, TuiSnyder.com. And you can click on the recaps and replay button up here. And it just kind of tells you what, what you missed. I have a, just a, you know, 10 talking points that we hit on and who the guest was. And, and then you could click to whichever one like, oh, that show sounds kind of cool. I want to catch that replay. So that just trying to make it streamline it and see, hopefully that will help you guys out. Now, um, who else here? I don't see anybody in the chat. I see though, it does say that we have some viewers coming in. So if you're shy or maybe you're on your phone, I know it's kind of hard to leave comments when you're watching on your phone. Anyway, thanks to everyone who is here. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I can't hear anything out of my left ear right now. I actually had a, a rather rough week. Uh, during last week's show, I was like, eh, I'm coming down with a cold, you know? I felt a little eh, under the weather. Cold, no big deal, right? In the middle of the night Thursday, woke up, could not hear anything. Felt like someone had an ice pick in my ear. Ugh, it was horrible. And I Googled it and they say that, oh, these things go away on their own. I didn't realize that if you have a fever, you're supposed to see the doctor, I, whatever. So it kind of went from there. And, uh, oh, hi, Wade's here. I'm glad you made it, Wade. Always nice to see you. Waka waka. Well, hey, Fozzie. <laughs> Great, thanks for showing up. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it just escalated. I was gonna, I thought, you know, Monday morning, I need to go see a doctor, long story short. And oh my gosh, it just, it was, it was awful. It got to the point where um, I read one of the things to, to help with, with an ear infection is to try and distract yourself. So it was like one in the morning, Saturday night, I'm trying to distract myself. I couldn't, I was trying to find some research to do, you know, books to read. I have tons of books on my phone, you know, in the Kindle app. I ended up, this is, this cracks me up. The only thing that I finally got my attention weirdly, and I have no idea why I got, fell down this rabbit hole. I spent like three hours reading it, detailed reviews on Amazon for teapots. I don't know why, but it helped. It distracted me. And then I fell asleep. And when I woke up, my eardrum had burst. It was horrible, blah, blah, blah. So, but here's the funny thing. I did get a teapot. <laughs> this is a really cool. I love it. You know what I love about it? And I, I'm, I'm more of an impulse buyer, so it was kind of neat that I actually did my research. This thing does not drip. And if you like tea as much as I do, and they're always dripping all over the place, and it's cute and happy, cheerful colors. So there you go. So, you know, one good thing came out of my misery. But um, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, I have 
my husband keeps telling me I alternate between like whispering and then shouting and not realizing. So if I do it that, I know you guys will just tell me any idea if that works for tonight. You know, I think distracting yourself from anything, just, just go read some, get obsessed about something weird. I, usually research helps, but I just couldn't, I don't know why it ended up being teapots for me. It was just one of the weirder things that I've done. Now, since our guest is going to be talking about gargoyles, I told my newsletter about it this week, and I got a reply from Tim Folks, who lives over in Dallas. I've actually met him in person before. He's really nice, and I've met his wife as well, Gala. But he sent me this picture, and he said, here I've got it, Tim Folks. He goes, I love gargoyles. I have been fascinated by them for about 40 to 45 years. It comes from the 1972 movie Gargoyles. I have one on my desk. And so here's the cute one he has on his desk next to some paint or I mean some ink called Quink, which is kind of a cute name. Now what is funny was I had no idea there was a movie called Gargoyles. How did I miss out on that? Have you guys seen Gargoyles? If anyone there has seen Gargoyles, you need to tell me. I Of course, I had to go to IMDb right away and see what, where has this movie been my whole life? Now it is a horror film, but something about this cover tells me it's probably the type of horror that I could handle. <laughs> I'm not a big horror fan. So, and here's, here's the summary of the movie. An anthropologist slash paleontologist and his daughter, while traveling through the Southwest US, stumble upon a colony of living, breathing gargoyles. Yeah, it sounds like a, a must see. I'm gonna see if Netflix has it <laughs> and try and see it. So thanks, many thanks to Tim for sending me that picture of his desktop gargoyle and also telling me about that movie that I haven't seen. And by the way, I have a little gargoyle here. This is my bookshelf gargoyle. Um, my, my husband and I have gargoyles all over the place. So that's one reason I was super excited about this, um, having Jeff as our guest today, because uh, I'm surrounded by gargoyles. Our house it has a turret and the kids around here think it's haunted, you know, it's one of those places. And we have griffins out front and gargoyles all around. So just kind of exciting. And I should mention too, if you're not on my newsletter and maybe you would like to be, just drop by my website and you will see where it says free book click on that. And if you don't do anything and just sort of space out, this will pop up and it'll say want a free cemetery guide. I think I probably need to reword that like want a free book because not everyone in the world's thinking, gee, you know what make my life complete? A cemetery guide. <laughs> but not everybody's like me. But this is, a the guide is tells you what the symbolic meaning of hands are. And this is actually how I got my husband into and interested in hands, I mean, into cemetery symbols was by telling him about hands because, you know, everybody has hands for the most part and we all know they're easy to recognize. And so, yeah, go there if you're interested in that. Now, every week I have a faux sponsor. Oh, Nicole, sorry, you're like, no worries, Nicole, you, you're here now. <laughs> Thanks for coming. We always like to see you. Now, now we can start. <laughs> oh, you have seen gargoyles. It's on YouTube? Oh, thank you. All right, I will have to check that out. All right, good to know, good to know. That movie was on Zvenguli a few weeks back. Hmm, I don't even, wow. I don't even know what Zvenguli is, but it sounds cool. <laughs> okay, you guys will have to keep me in the loop. Now, as I was saying, I always have a, a fake sponsor. I couldn't really find a good uh, ad for Gargoyle. Um, but I did find this and I got a little captivated by it. This is an article from 1976 and it was about a guy named Frederick Hart, who at the time he was 32 years old and they were saying he was like the last of the gargoyle carvers. He's a sculptor. And then I read about him. You can look him up on Wikipedia if you want. I was thinking, wow, I'd love to have him as a guest. He's probably still alive. Sadly, he's not. He got really sick in 1999, so he's no longer with us. Um, so if you want to look at him up, though, I, I do suggest him. He's, he's interesting. Now, uh, what? Birds don't have hands? I think I'm missing the joke. <laughs> oh, well, it's going, you know, I'm a little slow on the uptake today, especially. I was telling our guests that I since I got these antibiotics they've got me on, they have made me a total ditz. So I do apologize. I'm not as sharp as usual. 
Now, my Patreon supporters, of course, they are the real supporters of the show. And so that means Bob, Connie, Ian, Scott, Ghost Cat, Jessica, Ann, Envy, Jay, Ken, Patty, Sarah, Julie, Margaret, Hugh, Mikhail, Naomi, Tim, Pete, Sarah, Rachel, and the other Tui. Woohoo! No relation to me. Okay, I think I should. Oh, yes, obviously, I need to tell you guys about our book of the week. And I think you can probably guess what our book of the week will be. Let me bring it up so I can show you. Our book of the week is none other than the book by our guest. This wonderful book, Guardians of Detroit. I highly recommend it. You can see it's nice and thick. This thing is hefty. It's probably two and a half pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's really gorgeous and it is just shock a block. I mean, it's shock a block full of um, photos. And I absolutely love it. I have it uh, facing out on my bookshelf so people can enjoy it. And uh, when I ordered it, it was really sweet of Jeff. Uh, we, had, we had already talked and invited him on the show, or I forget how it all went down. But um, he also has a, a, a like a companion coloring book, although everything's so cool. It's one of those things that would be hard for me to color at first. I guess you'd have to just break the ice and just do one page and then get into it. But I thought that was a really neat thing as well. So these are available at his website, which is Guardians of Detroit. Let me just show you in case anyone wants to see it. So you can, at any point, you can look up about him, guardiansofdetroit.com, check him out in that book. Oh my gosh, even if you don't buy it for yourself, which I take any excuse to buy books. I love books. But um, I would say um, it makes a great gift. So, you know, think about that. Okay. Oh, so this must be, you're saying Zven Gulli, kind of weird sci-fi show on me TV on Saturday. Oh, that sounds neat. I like, um, well, I like retro sci-fi as you guys know. <laughs> okay, so I forgot to tell you as well. This is an award, multi-award winning book. So high quality, through the roof quality. You guys are gonna love it. I love it. Now let me tell you a little bit about our guest before I bring him on. I'm gonna scroll down and find his bio. Where do I have it? And it's kind of fun. You know, what is neat is I really love, I met him through my book. He bought my Cemetery Symbols book and then emailed me, which was really neat. And that's one of the reasons I really love being a writer is that um, it's kind of a it's a kind of a conversation with the world, and you never know the people you know in your little town. You might not meet people who are interested in the same thing, but uh, through the magic of books these days, it's so easy to contact other authors. And I just love I've made another author friend, and I'm super happy to share him with you guys today. Won't keep them all to myself. So. Jeff Morrison is a historian and photographer. He's been taking pictures since he was nine years old and that's when his parents gave him his first camera. He has a bachelor's degree in history and art from Eastern Michigan University and over 30 years experience as a graphic artist creating the book Guardians of Detroit uh, that allowed him to combine both of his passions while exploring the historic architecture of a city he has come to love. I know a lot of channels on YouTube do focus on exploring, urban exploring. So I hope you know some of you guys might relate to that. Uh, now Jeff lives in Oxford, Michigan with his lovely wife, Susie, and their wonder dog, Manfred, who we were talking about before the show started. His dog sounds super cute. And I need to ask you guys help today. Like I said, I'm not feeling too sharp. so help me come up with good questions along the way and, and at the end. Uh, but he sent me, he was super organized, which was great. And he sent me all sorts of wonderful photos. So I am just gonna bring him on right now and we can say hi to Jeff, if I click the right button. How you doing, Jeff? <laughs> hi, Tui, I'm fine, how are you? Great, great, excited. It's nice to be here, to thanks for here. having me. Thanks for having yeah, me on. This is, oh, I'm, uh, it's wonderful. All right, I'm gonna set us aside and start showing a few, some of your wonderful photos. But you know what? I kind of want to ask, since before we dive in, the obvious question, which everyone asks you in every interview, I'm sure. <laughs> um, how did you come about this particular project? How did you settle on that? Um, well, it's architectural sculpture is something I've always been interested in. You know, when I was a kid, we'd drive by a building and um, see a, a statue in front of the building or sculptural work on a building. And I'd ask my dad, you know, 
who that was. And if it was in front of the library, he'd say, oh, that's Joe Library. Or if it was in, you know, Hillsdale, oh, that's Joe Hillsdale. So um, <laughs> I ended up having to, to do some research to find things out. And it was always kind of interesting. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I, I um, had some time on my hands and I was organizing some old pictures and came across some pictures I'd taken on uh, of architectural sculpture of some on some buildings down in Detroit. And I thought, you know, um, this could be a good project to work on. Um, maybe I could put together a booklet or a pamphlet of some kind. Maybe <laughs> maybe I'll get 100 pages out of it. And yeah, I could booklet. sell it to some gift <laughs> shops or something. And uh, oh the, the more I went um, down to Detroit and uh, you know, the more I worked in the project, the, uh, Detroit is just this great uh, repository for architectural sculpture. I just kept finding more and more. Um, Detroit really grew uh, from like the uh, late 1800s uh, in through the uh, through the 1930s, and you know there's this huge building boom because of all the business and the automotive industry and the lumber barons and the steel industry here in Detroit and iron ore and all this stuff moving through Detroit, and all these you know big shop people with lots of money wanted to build big wake of money. <laughs> yeah, big big buildings, big monuments to themselves, and the architectural styles of the time called for architectural sculpture. So we have a ton of architectural sculpture in a very small area. And uh, it, it just, got, like I said, I just kept finding more and more. Well, I had no idea. And your book really makes me want to go to Detroit. <laughs> so <laughs> It's a great like, city. Wow. It's a great city. Well, I have a friend in Michigan. So, you know, I'm on, now I, have, I actually have a couple friends in Michigan. So I'm like, you know, I'm just going to have to put it on there. Maybe we can book one of your walking tours. Yeah, yeah, All I right. do tours. You can... Um, Contact me through the website or email me at um, guardiansofdetroit at gmail.com or through the website. And uh, if you're, you're coming to town, we can set up a tour. I definitely, definitely. That would be so fun. Well, now I just got these and I plugged them in in the order that you sent them. So just, but it, like, you know, if you, we think of something else along the way, you can just tell me to go to a different one. I'm happy to, but sure, sure. Trinity, Trinity Episcopal Church, this is a gorgeous church. This is one of the coolest buildings in Detroit. Um, the, uh, the story behind it is kind of interesting. Uh, James Scripps, who was the uh, publisher of the Detroit News, he was uh, also a very religious man, and he moved into a house across the street from um, this little wooden church that used to be in this spot, and him and his wife joined that congregation, and he was very, very rich, and he paid to, to build this church, but he wanted a like an authentic Gothic church. So he sent historians to do research. And um, this is like one of the first and one of the best Gothic revival churches in the country. Wow. Um, it would not look at all out of place. It's, all, it's very truly Gothic more than Gothic revival. It would not look at all out of place in 13th century England. Yeah, I can imagine that actually, if I were over in England seeing this. Well, here, we'll look at some of the details on here that you've sent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this this building was, um, it was planned to have 172 carvings on it. Oh, so wow. there is just, it's just covered with architectural sculpture and gargoyles and grotesques. And um, for me, it's kind of, I started with this one because uh, for me, it's kind of the, the epitome of architectural sculpture, what I'm looking for, what I think of. Mm -hmm. When I think of architectural sculpture as all this great old stuff. Um, he was uh, very conservative uh, oh. and believed in the uh, reform Episcopal movement. So in, on this picture, the, the gargoyle in the lower left corner, it's damaged. So you can see some metal there where the, the oh, snout yeah. used to be. It's actually a wolf. In, oh, I was trying um, to figure out what creature that was. Yeah, all right. Yeah, with, with the, the parts that are damaged. It's a wolf in priest's clothing. Oh my you know, God! A warning to beware of uh, worldly priests or non-reform. You know, he felt the the church oh, was getting that. too worldly, so it's a warning to beware of those priests. I like the one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's three above him too, yeah, uh, and the one in the middle there looks so much like Yoda, but with shorter ears. <laughs> yeah, so like I, me, I you will. That one too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the one next to him is kind of Gollum, or the one in the mm -hmm. lower right corner is kind of like Gollum. What so are your you, you thoughts? See, this just came to me. What are your thoughts on, uh, I, I don't know what the word is on stone, but like patina, like when weathered stone, because I sometimes when I'm in a historic cemetery, 
I find that the wear on it, I think adds a certain aesthetic appeal to it. Although, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate the people who go out there and they clean things so that you can read the dates and everything. But on some sculptures that are out there, I kind of, I sometimes feel that the mother nature leaves a beauty mark on it, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, I think these are so much uh, more interesting to look at because of all the moss growing on them and the, you know, the black is is uh, soot and, and oh, okay. cinders because at the time the church was built, Detroit was heated mostly with coal. Oh, wow. So, you know, people like everybody wore a hat in those days and it wasn't just a, a fashion statement. It was because mm -hmm. you when you got home, you'd have cinders. If you didn't wear a hat, you'd have cinders and, and really? soot and ash in your hair because the, the sky was just full of it. I had no idea this whole time. I mean, I, I'm a hat person, <laughs> but I had no idea that there was uh, that practical level. I had been um, told by some people, a, a elderly guy in a nursing home once told me that when, when I was like a little kid that, oh, we wore hats because then we didn't have to get haircuts as often like during the depression. So maybe that could also be part of it. But I had never thought of the cinders in from coal being um, part of it too. Yep. Wow. People are loving it. Yeah. Aren't these great, Nicole? And she says, too, I have an old book, Nightmares in the Sky by Stephen King. And the photos are by F. Stop Fitzgerald. That's cute. <laughs> the photos I know are amazing. It's all gargoyles published in 1980. Oh, I'm I not aware. that up. Yeah. OK, more books, more books. You guys are feeding my addiction. <laughs> one, one of the things that was surprising to me when I, I first started this project was, uh, you know, I went online and looked for a book about architectural sculpture in Detroit. And there wasn't one. I was surprised that no one had done it yet. Isn't that funny? That's kind of why I ended up writing the Cemetery Symbols book. I just wanted something to carry in my bag that would fit next to my flower book of flowers and plants, you know, and in animals, you know, the different field guides I had. I wanted one for, okay, here's one for Cemetery Symbols, but I couldn't really find one. All right. That is really neat. So you have another one. Oh my gosh, these yep. faces are just so, you, they, what I love about them, they're so unique. It's not just, oh, well, just a face and it's the same one with slight variations. Yeah, yeah. The work was done by um, two different sculptors, by Edward Wagner and, and Richard Ruther. Ooh. And um, they were partners at the time. And uh, one did the, the sculpture on the east side of the building, and another did the sculpture on the west side of the building. And then they kind of met in the middle <laughs> on the north and south. Oh, that's and, funny. Um, they're also just uh, something to point out, the difference between gargoyles and grotesques. Yes. Um, gargoyles have a practical function. They channel water away from the water from the walls of the building to keep the walls from getting damaged. Ah. And grotesques have just more an more of an aesthetic function. Well, thank you for that. That's um, great. Mm -hmm. The uh, the gargoyle in the lower left here is kind of cool too. It's um this one? yeah, that one right there. It's a portrait of uh, the foreman, one of the foremen that worked on the building, which is oh. kind of a, a gothic tradition to memorialize some of the people that work on the building. Oh, that's neat. This building's also really cool where it has gargoyles. If you go back to the first picture, uh -huh. the one just before that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, up along the, the windows there, you can see the gargoyles sticking out. Yeah. Uh, everywhere there's a gargoyle on the outside there. On the inside of the church, there's a stone angel uh, singing or playing oh. a musical instrument. Oh, neat. So yeah, that's one of the one of the interesting things about this building. Yeah. Oh wow, that, yeah, it's really really neat. Well, I, I would definitely love to, to check that out. And I was looking here, I noticed they have. I wonder if that's supposed to be an ox. Uh, like I think Saint so. Luke. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Some people viewers might be interested that the four gospels have different. Uh, attributes they call them to so sometimes you'll see a, a, an ox and it stands for saint luke i had someone ask me like i was in europe and why did they have all these cows on the churches and i'm yeah. like oh the, the four gospels you know, there's you know matthew is an angel and mark is a lion when you go to venice there's lions all over and john's yeah. the eagle so anyway yeah that was uh, again one of the things that got me into it is the, the the project was i'd see things like a winged cow and it's why is there a winged cow in that church? Yeah, sounds very, I mean, here in Texas, I'd figure, well, you know, we, we worship our cows in a different sort of way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you see them memorialized like this, yeah, it's very different. Well, it's really amazing. There's so much personality to them. Okay, well, I guess we can move along here. 
Yep. So I'm Lachelle. Oh, hi, Lachelle. It's a new friend of mine, a new cemetery, new taffophile friend. Thanks hi, for coming Lachelle. by. Nice to have you here. I, I was hoping she'd show up. Okay, we've got the old city hall. This is a, a great old building that is no longer there. Oh. Um, it was built in 1879 and it was torn down in 1961. They made uh, such a big deal about it in uh, when it was built in 1879 where they talked about how this great building that our children will have to look at, you know, forever. And uh, it got torn down 90 years, about 90 years after it was built, just because Detroit um, was trying to modernize. Uh, they, that's, I've, I run into that. I'll hear about these really great buildings or I'll see a photo and then I'll, it's so sad that happens in Texas as well. Yep. Yeah, and then they you know, probably put up something kind of boring or did, <laughs> Uh, well, at first there was a, a parking lot. Oh, great. A, a park on the ground and then an underground mm -hmm. parking lot. And now they've built a, a, a pretty big office building on that site. Oh, here, someone's asking us a question. Kind of relates, I guess, before we... Uh, connection between gargoyles and music playing Angel's Placement. I don't know. Um, no, not that I know of. It's just I, one of the... the um, kind of a, you know, the gargoyles leaving, they're kind of pushing away from the building, moving outward from the building. And it's to to show any evil spirits approach that these gargoyles, these evil spirits are leaving the building. And just, you know, on the inside, you have the angels um, so just as a counterpart, a counterpoint. And well, I guess you could say there is a connection because that's one of the themes in Gothic buildings is opposites. And you'll see it a lot on um, window hood moldings. There'll be like an arch an arch over the window and oh. at either end there'll be a face and a lot of times it's a woman on one end and a man on the other oh, yeah. or uh, a, a young person on one end and an old person on the other mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of counterpoints so that's kind of a, a gothic oh. tradition so i guess there is a historic connection interesting yeah oh, okay now this building uh, when it was torn down there's on the tower you can kind of barely see them there's four statues of the um, civic virtues, they were called. Uh, they symbolized industry, commerce, justice, and the arts. Ah. And then um, on the front and on the back of the building, there were four statues of uh, his historic figures important to Detroit. Uh, Father Gabriel Richard, Antoine de la Moth Cadillac, who was the founder of Detroit in 1701. Oh. Uh, Robert de la Salle, whose uh, ship, the Griffin, was the first commercial vessel on Lake Erie. And um, uh, uh, Father Marquette, who was one of the missionaries to the Native Americans in the area. Wow. Well, Cadillac and LaSalle certainly have heard those names before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't realize. And then we have here. Um, this is when they, they uh, tore down the building. They tried to save the statues. And this is what's oh. left of the civic virtues statues. They came apart as they were um, being taken down or after they were um, wow. taken down. And they sat for years um, outside a warehouse and just exposed to the elements. And then they were finally brought into uh, the Detroit Historical Museum's warehouse uh, on the riverfront. There's Old Fort Detroit is on the um, river or for, historic Fort Wayne is on the riverfront. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they, they have a warehouse there, and these were all uh, kept there. These are all now kept in the warehouse. I was able to get in to take pictures of them. So those oh, are uh, two of the heads mm -hmm. um, from uh, uh, industry and commerce there on the left. And then that's oh. the, the torso of justice there on the top right. And then the lower right is uh, from uh, the one representing the arch. She has a little table next to her. And sitting on the table is a bust. That's the bust that was sitting on the table representing sculpture. Oh, all right. And then we have some more. Yeah, this is the head of justice. Oh, okay, gotcha. Wow. So, well, it's um, a shame they that at least no. they saved something, but it is a shame. It was always sad when they, that there's some really cool um, courthouses here in Texas and some of them have been um, taken down and they, put up some pretty boring buildings in their place. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. a lot of them remain, but, um, oh yeah. And then here, what's this now? Now these are the three of the four historic figures on the, the left. Oh yeah. Is um, 
Father Gabriel Richard, mm -hmm. and in the middle is Cadillac, Cadillac. and on the right is LaSalle. And these were, uh, they were in a, a park on Wayne State University campus um, on pedestals in the park. Mm -hmm. And uh, LaSalle, or excuse me, Cadillac was positioned, the, the, the other three were positioned so they looked forward and Cadillac was positioned so he looked toward the Detroit River where he, um, his landing spot. Yeah, you know, that's one thing that I, I, I love about sculpture is that um, quite often there's so much to it, like the placement of it is part of it, like it's facing east because it wants to let you know that they, you know, this or that happened over there and there's just so much to it. <laughs> I like that yeah. part of it. And Father Richard, I mean, he's a priest, but he, he looks so so stern and forbidding. He does. Um, he was also one of the founders of the University of Michigan. Oh, yeah, he, he, he looks a little scary, yeah. intimidating. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see here. This is wonderful. Okay, now the now, Wayne uh, County Court building. Or now this County building, building. Yeah, this is across um, kind of like a, a, a an open area, a, a square across the square from the old city hall. Mm -hmm. um, but this one is still there. This was not torn down. And uh, this is a great old Beaujard uh, building that it's just like the epitome of Beaujard architecture. And you can see up there on the, there's the pediment, that big triangular shape in the middle. Yeah. Uh, we'll look at, we have some pictures of that. That's the Anthony oh, Wayne pediment. Up. Oh, and I then, think here. Yeah, yeah, that's the Anthony Wayne pediment. You can see, um, he, he was sent by General Washington to um, deal with some Nat uh, Native American Confederacy that was allied with the British. And this was shortly after the Revolutionary War had ended, but the British were refusing to give up uh, the territory out here. This was called the, this is Michigan and, and Ohio and Wisconsin was called the Northwest Territory at that time. Oh, yeah. Which you're, you're from the, the, the Northwest Territory. You said you're from Washington. Yeah, which, Pacific Northwest, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But this was the, the original Northwest Territory. So yeah. you can see that's Anthony Wayne in the middle uh, conversing with Native Americans on the right. And oh, then his yeah. soldiers behind him. And you can't see there's some settlers coming in from the, the left there. Ah, yeah, that's now. And, and I should show people, too, that you show what it looks like in your coloring book. <laughs> yeah, this I included a picture from the coloring book. This I thought the, that was a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like uh, the the one uh, Native American on the right. He he looks like you know the the folks are telling him yeah. you know the, Anthony Wayne saying this is how it's going to be, and he's kind of like you're you're telling me what now? Just yeah, there's, there's body language happening. Yeah, definite <laughs> reaction there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and this was by um, oh, uh, Edward Wagner. Yeah. We can we can that sculpture just want to mention was by Edward yeah. Wagner, who was okay. one of the sculptors on that church we were looking at earlier. Oh, okay. So I bet a lot of certain names kept cropping up as you went around, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you find that, like by the end of your book, you were really like, oh, I bet this is, you know, so-and-so or like you kind of get the sense or. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Corrado oh, okay. Carducci in a little bit. Oh, okay, okay. And and um, he's one that you, if you want to, um, this doesn't happen to be by him, but if you want to look mm -hmm. like a, a smart person walking around, like you know anything about sculpture in Detroit walking around, <laughs> you can say that's by Corrado Parducci and you stand a good chance of being right. Oh, okay. That's good to know. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit more. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I do have a question. Like, was it, um, you know, some of these, well, okay, I noticed like when I walk around Seattle and stuff, I'm always looking up, looking up. A lot of things are up high. Did you have to climb out to get anything? Was it hard? Or did you just use telephoto? I mean, how did you you get such great shots and you don't look like you're far away in them? So no, I, I I mostly use a telephoto lens. I have it sitting out. Mm -hmm. This, Here, let's this see is the kit. lens I use. It's a oh. um, <laughs> 600 millimeter zoom lens. <laughs> you can't even fit it. It actually, <laughs> it extends even further. Oh my goodness. Can't, can't get it all in the picture. Yeah, I know. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so Wow. Mm -hmm. That's what, what it, I use Wow! Uh, for the most part. I guess a tripod must be <laughs> involved, huh? It's almost all handheld. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, there's there's um, technology built into the lens these days. Uh, first of all, that you can get a, a very high shutter speed mm -hmm. um, by, by 
you know, so it, you need a high shutter speed if you're hand holding a lens that long, because any movement at the end, you know, on your end is really magnified by the time it gets to the lens. Yeah. So you want a really fast shutter speed and you're able to do that. Um, and then there's also um, uh, motion uh, dampening technology built into the oh. camera too. Oh, all so right. Wow. Well, I'm super impressed. <laughs> Anybody also, wants to know the details about the lens? It's not an, it's, this one in particular is not a, an especially um, expensive lens. If you email me, I can tell you um, a little bit more about it. Oh, all right. Well, my, my story about camera lenses is I had, I had my, uh, my iPhone and I had this little um, attachment lens and I, I went, we were down in South Florida on a, uh, this bird walk trail. And I mean, oh, everyone there had so much kit. I mean, it was just incredible. There were serious birders were there. And I was just, I was trying to take a picture of this little red winged blackbird came really close to me, <coughs> pardon me. And um, I had, my, I was adjusting my little, you know, sort of being quiet, had my little, my little thing going. And suddenly this flock of like, professionals were like, what are you using? What's that all about? I'm like, oh my goodness, I felt so embarrassed. Like, it's just this goofy little thing. And they're like, let me see it. They're playing with it. It was so funny. I thought I would pass unknown, but they were enjoying it. <laughs> it's interesting that you're, are you, do you consider yourself a birder or? or? Yeah, I can't help it. I love birds. I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm, my, my, my brother's a birder. I mentioned he lived in Texas. Oh, and yeah. I, I'm sort of a birder, not <laughs> as into it as he is. Mm -hmm. But that, that was why I had the telephoto lens in the first place, was for birding oh, I see. before I got into the art and nature photography in general, yeah. before I got into the architectural sculpture photography. We get a lot of neat migrating birds here, too, but I just I love all the backyard birds. I love them. I think they're a lot of fun. All right. Everyone's saying, wow, nice lens. People are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, guys. Well, this piece here is is mm -hmm. uh, called Progress. This is at the base of the tower. Oh. And um, it's a uh, uh, copper. It's not a solid statue. It's copper sheeting over a metal frame, the same kind of process oh. that was used for the Statue of Liberty. <clears throat> oh, all right. Yeah, I always see things and I always imagine them being solid. Of course, I, I don't know much about the actual making of it. I like that nice green, though, the nice patina. That's really pretty. Yeah, one of the uh, uh, city officials during World War II was not an art fan or thought the building looked old. He wanted to take the statues. There's two chariot statues like this and four smaller ones further up the tower. And he wanted to take mm -hmm. them and melt them down for the war effort. He thought they were Oh bronze. no. Oh, well, thank goodness they weren't. <laughs> yeah, they kept him from doing it. There was a big uproar. Wow. People don't get it. <laughs> no, no, they really don't. I mean, it adds so much to the, just when, you, when, you're, when you're in a city that has like nice architecture, you kind of, you feel, like dressed up a little bit. I mean, it just gives you a little civic pride. I don't know, it's my feelings. That's how I feel about it too. Mm. And then I just like this little guy. He's over one of the windows. <laughs> he's really cute. Yeah, or uh, excuse I, me, he's over one of the doors. Oh, okay. Yeah, he'd, be, he'd fit in around my house. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Someone says that lens is bigger than the apartment I had in the Tenderloin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It's a lot to log around. Oh, yeah, I can imagine that. Oh, the cute, yeah, cute dragon. All right. Well, let's see what we've got next here. Oh, this is so pretty. Yeah, this is this is just a beautiful fountain. Um, we have in Detroit, we're very lucky, we have a place called Belle Isle. And it's an island in the Detroit River that the whole island was kept as a park. Wow. And um, I think it's about so no five cars, miles so long. Are there cars on it, or oh, oh cars five are miles solid, probably. Yeah, okay. cars are allowed on it. There's a, a road around the outside, and then nature trails. And it, at one time there was a zoo, that's been closed down because of budget problems and stuff. But there's mm -hmm. a big, it's a nice nature center. There's a, a maritime museum. Uh, oh, there's an aquarium. One of the world's uh, oldest aquariums is there on Belle Isle. And that was closed for a while, but then it reopened. And they were talking about, you know, selling the land and building casinos out there and stuff like that. But they were, uh, they, they kept it as a park. Oh, thank and, goodness. Um, it sounds great. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful place. Uh, this is the, the James Scott Memorial Fountain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, those lions um, up there. Really yeah, nice. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting story there. This guy, James Scott, um, he was a... Uh, very rich man. And when he died, uh, 
he left five hundred thousand dollars in cash and um, income producing property. And this was in 1910 when he died. He left that to the city of Detroit to build a fountain on Belle Isle. But there was one condition. The fountain had to include a statue of him. Oh. <laughs> and the problem was nobody liked him very much. He had a reputation as being this kind of a bastard, um, a misanthrope, uh, a, mm -hmm. you know, a scurrilous mm -hmm. scallywag. He liked to hang out in the bar and tell dirty stories. And um, <laughs> he was very vindictive and lawsuit happy and all this other oh, stuff. Boy. And um, a lot of people got upset that he was trying to buy a memorial to himself you know? Yeah. And uh, oh. they spoke out on it, but other people said, you know, oh, he, he's not that bad. He told, you know, dirty stories, but only to people that wanted to hear them. <laughs> and uh, he, um, they eventually decided to accept the gift. It took 15 years of wow. debate and discussion, but they eventually decided to accept the gift. And uh, this fountain was finished in 1925. Oh, well, it sure looks nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful fountain. And then if you go to the next picture, uh, that's James Scott. And he's not actually in the fountain. He's off to the side um, oh, right. looking at the fountain and then gazing across the river um, at downtown Detroit. Is there a big, the fountain. big plaque saying what a nice guy he is? Or <laughs> Yeah, I see that cherry sitting on, on the back, it says, for the, you know, for his native uh, city and for the enjoyment of, of, his, of the citizens of Detroit. Yeah, well. he, let, he donated this fountain from the good deed. From the good deed of one comes pleasure to many. Well, yeah, at least he did something nice. If, whether no matter how you felt about him in life, he did something nice in the afterlife for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful Wonderful fountain. Photos. Um, it also yeah. has uh, at night. It has lights yeah. on it, different colored lights. Oh wow! I'm there. I love that. That sounds great. Birds love statues. Well, yes, <laughs> <laughs> there could be that. If you go back um, one, one sure. to the okay. fountain, yeah. Um, back in 1973, that fountain was home to an alligator for a little while. What? How did that happen? Well, they had alligators at the aquarium, which was about a mile and a half away, uh, okay. and they they thought the alligator um, had escaped. And they theorized that it ignored the river and all these canals on the island and the big reflecting <laughs> pool next to the fountain and somehow climbed up the stairs and got into the fountain. Wow. And um, what actually happened was the alligator had been kidnapped from the aquarium when no one was looking uh, by three teenagers. Oh. Because the Rolling Stones were coming to town. <laughs> and this was in the summer of 1973, July 1973, and they were going to release the alligator in the fountain in front of Cobo Hall where the Rolling Stones were going to play. Oh. And they got there and there were too many people and too many police. So they chickened out and brought him over back to Belle Isle and uh, put him in the fountain and oh then called gosh. the police and said, hey, there's an alligator in the fountain. So there's uh. pictures in the newspaper of the police wrangling this alligator and then taking it back to the aquarium. Oh, I'll have to look at some newspaper archives to see that. That sounds funny. Wow, what an escapade. I wanted to talk um, to the people, do an interview, uh, maybe a, a magazine article with the, the people that actually kidnapped the alligator. One yeah. of them contacted me. Oh, Because really? I mentioned it in the book in the section about the aquarium. Oh. Um, and I asked to do an interview, and they said he said they really don't want to. Oh, <laughs> so, that's too bad, you know? Yeah, I mean, come yeah. on, you were... It was just a moment, a dalliance in your youth. <sighs> well, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, you have to, if they don't want to, they don't want to. So I know I've been in that situation. You have to like, kind of respect such people's a great, feelings. I, I've had like caregivers tell me these stories and they're like, well, you can't use this story. I'm like, well, why did you <laughs> share this great story with me? Darn it. <laughs> and this person, wait, alligator in the fountain. That's right. That is right. <laughs> and so this one. We, Thanks yeah. for the fountain james you old curmudgeon you <laughs> yeah, yeah that's too much wow this is so pretty yeah this is um first presbyterian church mm -hmm. it was built in 1891 it's on woodward avenue which is kind of um detroit's main street in a lot of ways woodward mm -hmm. avenue but it's way um at the time it was built i mean now it's part of what's called midtown mm -hmm. but at the time of the build it was kind of a rural rural area it was very far north of Detroit. So, and it's made with this um, this 
sandstone. This it's all red sandstone from mm -hmm. the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, from a city called Houghton in the Keweenaw Pen Peninsula, which is a little peninsula off the Upper Peninsula, and it's about the northernmost point in Michigan, with the exception of uh, Isle Royal, which is on the other side of Lake Superior, but the the northernmost point connected to any you know major landmass. Oh. They brought all this sandstone down. As a matter of fact, I have a a piece of sandstone from that building. Oh, yeah, happens, it up, so it's, it's, it's it, show and tell, yeah. It's my show and tell piece. <laughs> um, the sandstone's really soft. And uh, over the years, you know, with the thaw and frost and freeze cycle that we have in uh, Michigan, yeah. it gets so cold and then it gets so warm, mm -hmm. uh, bits of it break off. So you find bits of stone around the base oh. of the building. So when yeah, we look- Yeah, I love that sandstone. Yeah, if, if we look at the next picture, um, you can see that a lot of the, the pieces have broken off the sculpture there. And it's funny, if I just saw this picture and didn't know, I would guess it was at a Scottish Rite Masonic temple with the two-headed eagle. So I thought that was interesting. I, I was raised Presbyterian, so I don't know. Now I'm curious why they have the two-headed eagle. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I had misidentified it in the book as a dove, and uh, that's what I thought it was at the time. And the, the two-headed eagle kind of represents... Um, the both aspects, like on a, a Presbyterian church, it would recognize the the congregation, the lay congregation, and the clergy as the the two oh, okay. parts of the church. I see. So yeah, it's also but... a um, uh, originally comes out of like the Byzantine. Yeah, uh, it's an old era, and it, it mm -hmm. represents uh, the power of the emperor as the dual power of the like, emperor. He's a, yeah, a temporal the, ruler yeah. and a religious ruler. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that is, that is interesting. It was a surprise. Just, I don't know. These symbols, they get used in a lot of different ways though. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So. But right. you can see how the stone kind of falls away there. It does get softened, doesn't it? Look at yeah. that. That's really pretty. And this I love is some, all of this. Yeah. Thing. Some more of the sculpture, that dragon there at the bottom, I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of uh, celtic -y. Yeah, yeah. And the faces are all kind of hidden in the stone a little bit. You know, you, they don't pop out until you um, take some time and look for them. And this yeah. is a, another building. The, the work here is by Edward Wagner, who oh. did the, you know, a couple of the other buildings we looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, that is nice. We have a, over in Waxahachie, Texas, they have a big red sandstone uh, courthouse and it's got a lot of carvings on it too but that I think it's one of my favorites I really like that if yeah, I could carve <laughs> go ahead this Keweenaw sandstone is is kind of soft there's other buildings in Michigan made from it and they all have the, that kind of they've really weathered over the years um, where there's sandstone from a city uh, called Ionia in Michigan mm -hmm. near the Grand River and that sandstone is really hard and really long lasting oh, okay. um, it's it's like easy to work when it first comes out of the ground. And then as it ages, it gets really solid and durable. And sculpture on those buildings uh, made with that kind of stone is is in much better shape. Ooh, I wonder if that's what they were expecting when they made this one. Well, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you got the, a cool high school. Now, is this still a high school? Uh, no, it's part of Wayne State University now. It was oh. originally Detroit Central High School, uh, but it eventually, uh, now it's called Old Main. It's one of the um, main classroom buildings are one of the oldest main classroom buildings on campus at Wayne State University, which is located in downtown Detroit. So this was built in uh, 1896, and it's on Cass Avenue, which is a block uh, west of Woodward Avenue, which is kind of a, another one of the uh, other major streets uh, that and goes through, comes oh, up out like of Detroit. Security things are they? Do people go up in there? <laughs> those like, what are those? Uh, yeah, they're just little towers. It's and like there's that, also they're very intriguing. I like them. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of falcons that live on the building too. Oh, that is cool! Wow, how neat! Yeah, and it, it has some great, great sculpture, especially around the entrance. Is that here? Yeah, yeah. Look at those and faces. Th this, yeah, this sculpture was um, hidden for a lot of years because uh, ivy. <laughs> oh. Excuse me, Ivy grew up on the building shortly after it was built. 
oh. and covered everything. And people didn't even know it was there until um, it was kind of cleaned up in uh, 1995. And they took all the ivy off the building and cleaned up the stone oh, wow. and discovered all these portraits of, of different scholarly figures on the building. I wonder if the ivy helped protect it a little bit from the soot and stuff. Those really look great shape. Yeah, yeah, they're in very good shape. Uh, if you go to the next one, it's a, a closer. Yeah. Oh, that's the owl at the corner. <laughs> oh, you see on a lot of schools. And you can see there's a, a face yeah. on either side of it. Oh, yeah. And then if you go to the next one, that's oh, Louis Pasteur. Oh, yeah, Louis Pasteur. So, so did, did he go or teach or anything here? I don't know. I don't know where Pasteur lives. Sounds French. I should know. I know pasteurized and all that. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe he was French. They, they just, they chose, you know, it's Learned an interesting folks. selection of, of people that they chose to put on this building. Um, Goethe, Galileo, Pasteur, uh, mm -hmm. Michelangelo, oh, yeah, Socrates, okay. Bach, uh, and oh. then Michael Faraday. Who, Faraday, who was oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. very involved in electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. um, Shakespeare used to be on it. There were a few on the front of the building that were removed when it became part of the university. And they oh. chiseled out um, Central High School and some of the faces and replaced it with words. Um, first, it was City College of Detroit, and then it was Wayne College, and then it was Wayne um, State University. So, you know, some of that was removed. I gotta say, yeah, I, I love buildings from this era, from the late 1800s and so forth. They really did put a lot of care into them and, and craftsmanship. Well, yeah, yeah, and especially it being a high school too. Yeah. You know, so much detail and, and work on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, all carved by hand. True, there was carved by a man named uh, Nygaard, Alfred F. Oh. Nygaard, who uh, right. also was a teacher. Um, a sculptor. He, did, he worked on a lot of buildings around the city. And then he also helped found um, the uh, College for Creative Studies here in Detroit. He was wow. one of the founding teachers there. No, that's cool. Oh, uh, let's see what you have here now. Oh, First State Bank. Yeah, this is a, a building uh, that's kind of a turning point in uh, Detroit architectural history. Uh, not because of who designed it. It was designed by Albert Kahn, who's um, he's kind of known as the man who built Detroit. Uh, huh. He designed a lot of the, the big buildings in Detroit. He's also uh, Henry Ford's architect and designed a lot of factories. Oh. Um, and at one time, you could say uh, he, he designed um, buildings for the Soviet Union. Hmm. And it's not an exaggeration that he helped win World War II because uh, he built all these factories for the Soviet Union that were originally intended to build agricultural equipment and then got turned to war production during World War II and allowed the Soviets to help um, defeat the Germans when they invaded. Wow. And that it, is it quite used a to connection. be said, yeah, yeah. It used to be said that the sun never set on an Albert Kahn building. Oh. <laughs> because there was they were all around the world. But I, uh, didn't, I didn't know anything about him. That's really neat. Yeah, and, and, but the reason it's a turning point for Detroit architecture is because the sculpture on the building is by a man named Corrado Parducci. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's the name that you're yeah. saying comes up a lot, huh? Yeah, <laughs> is, he, the, is this, he did this. Pardon me. Is this one of his then? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, this is one of his sculptures. Um, he came from Italy when he was a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, then came to Detroit. He lived in New York. He grew up. He was born. He was raised in New York. Um, and Khan contracted with uh, Anthony Di Lorenzo and company where uh, Parducci worked. Parducci did the models. They used to do, they would do plaster models. The sculptor oh. would do plaster models. Then they would be given to the stone carvers, and then the stone carvers would be up on um, like scaffolding. And stuff? Yeah, wow. okay. Carving these, these figures and these pieces in the stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, this ha particular building was being worked on in the middle of winter. And oh, Khan was ready to get on in years, and he did not want to be going up and down the scaffolding in the middle of winter to supervise and make sure the sculpture was being done right. So he brought Parducci to town. And oh. Parducci was a much younger man. He was in his 20s at the time. And he came to town and supervised the work. And then he got so much work from all the other, from Khan and from all the other big architects in town that he never moved back to New York. 
Oh. He bought out his contract with DiLorenzo and just about every major building in Detroit from 1925 on has Parducci's work in it or on it. He was a, a workaholic, uh, slept at his studio during the week, only saw his family on weekends. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and this is another piece from that building. This is um, the Roman god Mercury, who is the god of commerce, as yeah, well as being the messenger his, god. Caduceus here. And, yeah. and I like the, the winged hourglass, which I... Yep. Time flies. flies. Yeah, <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> I use that yeah, at the end. Yeah, and then he's holding a ship to ship. represent uh, international commerce. All right. I was wondering. Oh, and I guess the, someone's asking what year was the sculpture made? They wonder when these. This was made 1925. Oh. This building was made in 1925. Yeah, this one has. This a bit, was done. Well, there's sort of a stockiness to the eagles and stuff that kind of reminds me of that sort of stocky body that you get like a little later with the yeah. art deco. Yeah, it's kind of a, a it's, kind of transitioning into a little bit more art deco style. Yeah. Um, Parducci was really kind of a, a stylistic chameleon. You can, hmm. it's sometimes hard to say, you know, identify a Parducci style because he worked in so many different styles. He, he knew all the different styles. <laughs> And um, maybe that the, made it more fun for him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the architects would, would trust him, you know, they would give like a rough indication of what they wanted and mm -hmm. trust him to make a, like a model that, you know, like a clay, a sketching clay. Um, and then um, they would say yay or nay, and he'd go on and do finished work. Uh, sometimes on the plans, the Albert Kahn would just write Parducci in the space oh. where there was supposed to be a sculpture rather than sketch out any kind of sculpture. Wow, well, it must have felt nice not to be micromanaged. Yeah. <laughs> People like yeah. you so much, They're like, hey, Parducci, just do your thing. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I really, really love that. That's great. All right, let's see what you have here. Oh, Francis Parkman Library. Yeah, I love this libraries. There's a beautiful library. Uh, it's kind of a neighborhood library and it was uh, built in 1931, it was kind of a new concept in libraries for big cities because what typically you had in big cities was a main library and then a bunch of small branch libraries. Yeah. And you would go to the branch library and you say you wanted a book, you would have access to the card catalog to the main library and you would order the book and then a day or two later the book would arrive. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the larger branch libraries where it was oh. supposed to be less dependent on the main library. Kind of have, kind of have the main hits. Oh, people are asking, I think Parducci, that sounds like how it's. Yeah. Parducci. P-A-R-D-U-C-C-I. Yeah. Parducci. Yeah. First name Corrado, C-O-R-R-A-D-O. -R -R and his middle name was Joseph. He sometimes went by Joe or Joe um, Parducci. Oh, okay. So, Oh, notification. Oh, yeah. YouTube sometimes doesn't give notifications. Like I'll sign up for reminders and I don't always get them. I love this series of faces. Yeah, they're over the entrance. And uh, this oh. is probably Parducci's work, but mm -hmm. I couldn't find documentation that, that said it was. But you can see how different it is from the, mm -hmm. the other work. Yeah, that is really different. Now, uh -oh. and also, uh, it kind of makes me think of, you know, see, see no evil, hear no evil. I mean, it seems like they're each, they, each of the expressions is so distinct. That's really kind of fun. And there's actually nine of them over the entrance. Oh. And they're, they're about, uh, I think they're about eight inches square, six inches square, just oh, set okay. in the molding above the entrance. How neat. And it's kind of a, a neighborhood library. So I, mm -hmm. I think they're kind of there to entertain the kids. I expected a lot of kids oh. uh, to be coming to that library. And there was... Um, mm -hmm. A big yeah, children's library, reading room in that library, that kind of thing. Oh, that was thoughtful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nicole says they look more modern. Yeah, they do. I had a question. Um, like, did you to to do to take these photos and to put them in your book? Did you have to ask permission from any of the places whether they wanted to be in your book? I never thought about that. Or it's okay, just you know, they're there. I mean, I take if you can if you can shoot it public. from the sidewalk, mm -hmm. it's public. You don't need permission. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I, yeah. Although like the Fox Theater, uh -huh. um, I was on the sidewalk shooting and they came out, a security guard came out and said, uh, you, you can't take pictures of our building. What? Wow. So well, I just okay, then. nod and smile and walk away and came back another day. Because 
<laughs> you can I mean, legally if you can see it from the sidewalk you can take pictures of it it's that's a good point just because someone says you can't doesn't mean they really know either <laughs> yeah now yeah. I, I was careful though i i did not i i had originally planned to feature the fox theater in in the book mm -hmm. and because of that encounter i tried to get written permission from mm -hmm. them from the uh, illich corporation yeah. Uh, who owns it. And I was never able to get through to anybody uh, to give oh. me permission. So I didn't include it as a feature building. I just have it in the back as one of the other buildings of note. Oh, okay. Well, they're lost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I had plenty of other buildings to choose from. So. Oh, you, this book is just chock-a-block full. Yeah. It must That must have been a very hard part of the process, deciding what you couldn't fit in there. Um, this, this is a is pretty the, picture. Yeah, this is the Fisher Building, mm -hmm. and uh, people from you see the the golden top there at the top, the light on the top. Yeah. Uh, people that grew up in Michigan will uh, relate to this because uh, radio station WJR had their uh, studios in there. They were the great voice of the Great Lakes. Oh. Uh, they're, they're still still around, but they had studios in the Fisher Building. And they had a deal with the owners of the building that they had their studio space for free as long as uh, at every station break, they identified their broadcasts as coming from the Golden Tower of the Fisher Building. Oh, <laughs> wow. And originally that, that tower had gold leaf on it. Ah. And they shined lights on it at night and it really, really shone. Yeah, must have really, yeah. And then during World War II, they were afraid of air raids, you know, because Detroit oh. was the arsenal of democracy and they put asphalt over the the, ah. the gold tiles wow. and then after the war they couldn't remove the asphalt so oh. they put uh, new tiles over it just like green metal metallic tiles mm -hmm. and they light it up at night with golden lights boy to think there's this nice gold tiles underneath that yeah <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness well what are you gonna do um and this building is sometimes referred to as detroit's largest art object Ooh. it's another building designed by albert Kahn. Um, it's considered his masterpiece as far as um, office buildings are, are concerned. Yeah. It was built, it's 33 stories tall, mm -hmm. and it was built in 15 months. Wow. Yeah. So, um, 15 months on a skyscraper today, you're, you're probably just getting the first level of the superstructure done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, they were somehow very organized, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, an army of workmen working around the clock and yeah. uh, less concern for unions and mm. work rules and maybe sa safety issues. And Well, yeah, some thoughts like that. That's true. That era, some things. <laughs> so uh, Arducci worked on this building, but the mm -hmm. most of the sculpture was designed by a man named Geza Marodi. Oh. Who was a Hungarian sculptor. Mm. And he wanted to create like a, a new style of of sculpture and art and it's a very modern look very art deco mm -hmm. look yeah it really is so yeah. this is these are pieces from around the entrance and i love too you know the the uh, fisher building up there that's so pretty the uh, yeah. lettering and then uh, if you go to the next slide um oh are, yeah the eagles were were uh, on some of the towers mm -hmm. and then these faces and the the eagle in the middle there at the top Mm -hmm. And um, the the four faces on the right, the two lower ones were bronze, so they they have that patina to them. But these were yeah. kind of stone, the other ones. Mm -hmm. This looks so interesting. Yeah, they're based on hu Hungarian folk images. Oh, okay. And it kind of looks were, like Ionian columns or something. Yeah, first. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were um, gilded in gold. All this stone, oh, they were? the wow. eagle, and those those four faces all had gold. If you look at, at it today you, you can still see remnants of it most of it's just tarnished or flaked off though okay they didn't take it off intentionally during world war ii this is kind of weathered away yeah just kind of weathered away oh wow yeah it's really really neat and then uh this this is that same building huh yeah that same building and these are wow. all up near the top like look you can see on that top picture looking up mm -hmm. 33 stories above the ground oh yeah jeez and uh this was a, a special kind of marvel um, uh, it's called Beaver Dam oh. Marvilla Marble. I would not have guessed from, that was marble. Huh. Yeah, it's it's. It came from a quarry in Maryland, and the oh. Fisher Brothers actually 
um, invested in the quarry and provided equipment and stuff so they would always have enough marble on hand because this was by far the biggest order that mm -hmm. quarry had ever gotten. So yeah. you know, they wanted to make sure they'd have enough marble on hand to finish the building. Wow, it's really amazing. It's yeah, just, that this stuff, one's kind of like a lizard or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, like a gecko. Oh, yeah. And then, and then the then one uh, next to it's an, an elephant. Okay. I've and below you. that is, um, I yeah, don't know, a pig or like, hippopotamus or something. Yeah. I know they're so interesting. Yeah, really? they're great. Great yeah. shape. They're all, you need binoculars or a telephoto lens to see them because they're all you know, yeah. 30 floors or more above ground level. You just must go around with a crick in your neck all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Yeah, that is really cool. When I um, do uh, book signings, I, I always write, look up. Look up, yeah, no kidding. Remind people that there's so much to see. Yeah, I know that's the thing. You just, we just walk right by it. Most, uh, it seems like most cities don't really start this stuff until like one or two stories up and then you look up and you're like, oh my gosh, it's really great. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, we got the Guardian building. Um, this is a, a very cool building. It, this is designed by Wirt Roland, an architect named Wirt Roland. And, um, you know, Albert Kahn is very well recognized in Detroit as building so many buildings in Detroit. And Wirt Roland is, is less well known, but this is the third of three skyscrapers that he built in Detroit. And they're all within um, like a block or two of each other. They're all on Griswold Street. Uh, they're all bank buildings. Uh, this one's unique because of the color. It had um, these um, specially formulated color bricks for the building, two million bricks on the outside of that building. It's the largest brick clad building in the world. And it was known as the Cathedral of Banking because his concept was to get all these different craftsmen together uh, to build this beautiful building. And the inside is beautiful too. I don't have pictures of the inside because um, I, I could not have had a book big enough to show the insides of these buildings. <laughs> Another book. <laughs> if you ever come to Detroit, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, they do tours um, or you can, it's open to the public. You can just step inside and take a look around. Uh, okay. the lower levels. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. Well, yeah, you really ignited my, I never knew that Detroit was on my, my bucket travel list. But now it's on my, now it's on my travel list. Some great cemeteries in Detroit too. Oh, I was going to ask you. I mean, there has to be with all this much money going through these much, you know, interesting sculpture. I bet Parducci maybe, maybe he was even commissioned for some, who knows? Uh, he, he did do a couple. Oh, okay. Well, I'm there. <laughs> he, he did the sculpture on this building. Oh. And you can see again, it's a different sort of a yeah. sculpture. Mm -hmm. And then the, those are mosaics. Um, colors, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were. there's a company in Detroit called uh, Powabic Pottery. Hmm. And it's been around for years and years. Um, and these were these mosaics were custom designed and made by this company, uh, Powabic Pottery. That that dome, that huge dome over the entrance, they had to, they didn't have room in the studio to make it. So they had to build a, they dug a big hole in the ground in front of their building uh, so they could uh, create this, the inside of this dome. Wow. The color scheme is almost kind of Southwestern-y in this part anyway to me, but I don't know. It's really interesting. It's a, it's a neat color scheme. Yeah, and that's supposed like to be uh, an aviator there in the middle of the dome. Representing oh, Christ. wow. Then, I did not pick up on that. Okay. Those, those three uh, medallions there on the left. These here? Mm -hmm. They're actually part of the dome too, and they represent I see an airplane here. I think. Oh, yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. They represent the three aspects of industry or of, of um, commerce. At the top, you have industry. In the middle, you have agriculture, and then at the bottom, you have transportation. You have the train and the ship and an airplane. Oh, here we have someone. Tuli, I'm in Austin, but originally from Austin. I'll take you. The cemeteries are off the charts. Oh, and then oh, originally from. Detroit. Oh, okay. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, all righty. Okay. Well, you guys, I will definitely announce if I get to go up to Detroit, you guys will hear about it first. I'll be asking for advice. <laughs> oh, hi, Debbie. It's our Canadian friend here. Hi. hi. How are you doing? Oh, hey. She's wonderful. Yeah, you'll 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 want to rewatch this one, Debbie. It's been a lot of fun. You, you're gonna love all the photos. Oh, here, let me see how to take this off. Okay. Yeah, it's really neat. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I just saw we were getting a lot no, of stuff. No, no, that's I was pretty much what I had to say about it. <laughs> oh, okay. 
All right. And then now we have St. John's Episcopal Church. And there are really some gorgeous old churches in Detroit. Yeah, there's okay. some some fantastic churches. This is a church uh, that was built in 1861. Mm. And um, they it's on Woodward Avenue as well. And there was a big project to widen Woodward in the 1930s. And mm -hmm. the church got condemnation money from the city because, uh, you know, they, they needed to widen the road and the church was oh. in the way. And ah. the congregation, rather than tear down the church, they picked up the whole thing and moved it 60 feet to the east and then it put it back down. It amazes me <laughs> when they move buildings. I'm always amazed. Well, wow, well, that's really neat. Way to respect the craftsmanship, I guess. <laughs> that is incredible. Does not sound like an easy task. No, yeah, we'll just no, move it 60 feet. Uh, yeah, right. Looks they, good on like, <laughs> they, they disassembled the tower mm -hmm. and marked, you know, everything so they could reassemble it. And they put it up on rollers. And um, it's amazing looking at some of these old buildings. Uh, yeah. So, how, so many times in the 30s and 40s, where in the 20s, where buildings were moved rather than torn down. Yeah. I, it is interesting. I, I, I'm glad that they saved it. I mean, it, this could have been another sad story where like, there's this beautiful old church and then, you know, they tore it down. Look at these. These are really cool. Yeah, there's a ton of faces on this church. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I love that big one on the on the left there. That one? <laughs> uh, yeah. And, it, and the eyes on this one really. Kind yeah, of pop. yeah. And that, that big one on the left, I when I'm uh, doing my presentations, like at libraries and things, um, I usually uh, open with this picture and ask how many people have seen it because it's right by Comerica Park where the Tigers play. Oh, okay. And um, there's a hockey town cafe and all the parking across mm -hmm. the street. So a lot of people will cross the street and walk right past his face on their way to Comerica Park and never see it. Oh, because, all right. So, mm -hmm. And that's really part of what the, the Guardians of Detroit project is about is to bring all this evil, easily overlooked stuff uh, down from the heights and out mm -hmm. into the open and up close for people to see and enjoy. Well, that's kind of my whole travel philosophy or my whole thing is the offbeat and overlooked. I think there are so many things that so much beauty and so many cool things in your own hometown. Like I, I like to say even home is a travel destination because people don't realize just around the corner from you, there's probably some interesting bit of folklore or a cool statue or something like this. You might be walking by every day. And if you just take the time to really look. I think most people think you to travel, you have to, you know, get jet lag and go far away. There's something cool where you live. It's exotic to someone else in the world. So, you know, save yourself some airfare. I mean, I, not that I don't like to travel around, but but I, I one reason your project really hits home to me is that I can, you're showing people who live in Detroit, like, hey, look how cool it is and what you're probably missing. So I think that's really, really great. Well, the, the new project I'm working on. Oh, yeah, that was another question kind of ties in with what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, Guardians of Detroit just focus solely, focuses solely on buildings within the city limits of Detroit. And uh, I'm now working on Guardians of Michigan, oh. which is architectural sculpture through the rest of Michigan. We have some great old courthouses, I bet. Um, churches, libraries, a lot of Carnegie libraries, oh, I love um, that. banks, mm -hmm. office buildings, uh, all, all kinds of places, old post offices that are just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. The old and, post offices are, are really overlooked quite often. Mm -hmm. And just driving around Michigan and going to all these little, little towns. You know, you'll go to the, these towns that are you know, not much bigger than Oxford, just little little towns, and they'll mm -hmm. have the county courthouse, this huge county court country that the people have so proud of and they've maintained and, you know, never torn down and um, they mm -hmm. kept it up over the years and refurbished it over the years. And there's still th these buildings in fantastic shape. So uh, that's the book I'm working on next. And that will, that'll be out um, probably um, in uh, fall of 2022. Wow. Okay. Well, so we good. That finished. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of like a super fun project and like a great book and a book that people could then plan, you know, little road trips to go see from there, I, you know, check all the things. That sounds really great. But your book, Guardians of Detroit, will keep people plenty busy before then. <laughs> yeah. And they can use that as a guide too. And the, 
in the back there's maps that, that show where all I the buildings are. I love that you did that. Yeah, you have them by topic and things. I thought that was really great. And then the, the new book is organized by city. So you can, you know, go to a city and, and find mm -hmm. everything based on that. Oh, that's helpful. Okay, well, I want to tell people that, you know, time does fly, time flies. I always, that's why I was laughing because I always have this at the end of our thing. So you guys be thinking of uh, questions for Jeff here. Um, now, remember, you you know, after uh, the show, you want to make sure you go and check him out at his website. He also has an Instagram. I know some of you guys are on Instagram, so check that out. I haven't posted on mine for a long time. I've been remiss, but I'll get back into that. Um, so, and I'll give you guys a couple minutes. Of course, you know, take time to look around my channel. I have a um, a, <laughs> a popular video about where the grave for you know Chewbacca, Peter Mayhew. I have one about astrology in the Bible. Since we touched on sci-fi earlier, my husband made a homemade Robbie the robot. Oh, outfit. that is so cool! Check, it is amazing. <laughs> He's actually inside of it here. We're at the um. This is it before, he, and this is it in him. It takes about two people in twenty minutes to get him in it. <laughs> I should show you this. My my daughter-in-law oh. uh -huh. painted this for me. It's the Lost oh. in Space robot. <laughs> oh, yeah, B9, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. Which yep. is my favorite robot. And Robbie the oh, robot okay. was used on Lost in Space. Yeah, he was used on so many things. He was even in the love boat, apparently. I have not. I've seen it on Columbo. I saw the Columbo um, episode, but I haven't seen the love boat one. And then I have one about the space alien grave. So people, oh, and I should tell people next week, we've got a, oh, well, you're here. <laughs> you're here now. Yo, wait, he's coming back. <laughs> well, I do want to have you back, especially for your other book. But next week we have Courtney Barak, who will be talking about mermaids and submerged cemeteries. And she's just a ray of sunshine, super sweet. Um, okay, guys, if you have questions for Jeff, Thank you, Jeff, for sharing your photos and book. Oh, <laughs> danger, danger, Will Rods. <laughs> Eight hours to Detroit. Well, you might have to make a trip. And now uh, Jeff does do uh, walking tours. Yep. And so how, how do people book those tours with you? Uh, you can go to the website or there's not actually a, there's a message um, uh, link on the website. And you can contact me through there or you can just contact me at uh Guardians of Detroit at gmail.com. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. And just email me and we'll we'll set something up. Yeah. All right. Now, um, does anybody have any questions for Jeff? I'm trying to think. I know I had a few. I, I think I was just sort of blurting them out along the way. So you already told us what's next. I wanted to ask about that. I was curious, do you, what is your advice to someone who wanted to create a coffee table book? Because it seems like an awfully intimidating process. Um, um, boy, I've never been asked that question. That's a good oh. question. Um, for for me, I could just say what, what worked for me was finding something that um, I had a, a really strong interest in. You know, I was passionate about it. Um, it helped me. Uh, it helped that I have a background in the graphic arts because I was I laid yeah, everything. Yeah, you could tell. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Wayne State University Press, who published the book, they they did it all over again. Oh, uh -huh. and, and changed some things and rearranged it, but that was just that helped me um, get the the process down. Helped me decide which pictures to use and all that sort of thing. So just laying out all the pages and how I wanted them to look, that was a big help. What um, software did you lay it out in? Was uh, I used or? Park Express, which is oh, a page, okay, it's sure. an older page mm -hmm. publishing program. And then for the new one, I'm using InDesign. Oh, which I've is by Adobe. Either, but, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. I was just curious because it just, it's such a gorgeous book and really neat. Everybody, you guys have got to check it out. <laughs> Let's see what my other question I did a ton of research too. Yeah. That's fun though. I love doing research. Kind of, I love. It, you know, you, you can kind of get sucked off on the, at least I can, I can get distracted and go off onto um, tangents if I'm not careful. You know how one thing leads to another thing to another thing? Like I was, yeah. even with the gargoyles when I was preparing for this, I was like, oh boy. I, <laughs> but, I would say yeah, another thing, it, uh, uh, the best thing that worked for me was having a schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I know I was fortunate because I, I didn't have, I don't have a job, mm -hmm. um, semi-retired. And... Uh, you know, I'm 
up. I'm, I'm working on the, the book every morning at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. so like as if I have a job. And I think that's for doing Being a book. Like this, yeah. Um, it takes some discipline. You have to, I think, set yourself a schedule and, and um, sticking to it as best you can is a big help. Yeah. When people ask me about writing books, I quickly, I try to ascertain whether they really want to write a book or they're more interested in, in having written a book. Yeah. <laughs> because it's kind of like after mine, it's like you wouldn't just go, hey, I want to run the Boston Marathon. You know, you, you would realize that that would then take some training. Everyone realizes that. But since everyone can, you know, we can all write, we figure that, ah, you know, writing, I'm like, mm, writing's kind of like a sport as well. You need to stick with it and keep going. And it's that whole, it's not just like, but that every now and then I, people, uh, I realize that they just really want to have done a book rather than actually put yeah. into it. I, I enjoy a lot of all the process behind it. Um, so this person's asking, which city has the best collection of gargoyles, or uh, I guess you know, in Michigan? I think Detroit is hard to beat. I know Chicago has a lot. New York has a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're comparable. Uh, one of the things about Detroit is everything is pretty close together. Um, oh, okay. Detroit's a, a, a big city. It's a spread out city. Uh, mm -hmm. But the downtown where most of these buildings are is fairly compact. Um, I would say that maybe 75% of the buildings in the book Somewhere around that are in uh, two areas, in the, the downtown area, the financial district in downtown, and then in the area called Midtown. That is nice then. So, yeah. You're visiting and you want to see them all. Okay, and then this, Debbie wants to know, is there a pocket guide with the maps as well? Uh, not for architectural sculpture. The, the book has the maps in it. Uh, there isn't a pocket guide. There is a, a pocket guide to architecture in Detroit, the AIA, American Institute of Architecture um, oh. guide uh, to buildings in Detroit. And it has maps and, and uh, oh, okay. a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good book. Oh, all right. And uh, Jeff explain what is behind him in the background. Let me see. Well, he did to me, I think before the interview started. Um, it's a couple of pictures from uh, buildings in Detroit. The one um, here, is from a building called the Maccabees Building, and um, that was the Maccabees were like a, oh, yeah. basically an insurance society, a mutual aid society, uh, based on um, Jewish history. And those are the Knights of the Maccabees uh, around the entrance of the building. That is really cool. And then uh, the one from the right, on, or on the other side, is from a bank um, in Detroit. Uh, oh, just okay. next door to the, um, uh, let's see, it's next door to the um, First State Bank. And mm -hmm. it is, let me look in the book here. The name's okay. escaped, but it's uh, security. It's the Security Trust Building. Oh, all right. In Detroit on Griswold, uh, right next door to the uh, First State Bank. And he has prints for sale on his website, too, I should tell people. So you might want to go check those out. <laughs> <laughs> you make sure you go after the show, Guardians of Detroit, and there's let's check it out. Get a book, buy one for yourself, get one for a friend. Yeah, <laughs> I, I already have one. <laughs> What's that? And a coloring book. And a coloring book. Don't forget. Lots of fun. All right. Well, we've kept you nearly an hour and a half. So unless somebody has a burning question, I'm going to let you go. I so so appreciate you coming this was neat i learned a lot uh i knew i would learn a lot what is this here someone's oh we got a question real quick are grotesque considered guardians of sorts um they are when we looked at the um when we looked at the guardian building there's sentry giant sentry figures on either side of the building one holds a key and the other holds a sword and then over the top is a lion and the, the lions are kind of guardians as well uh some banks have guard dog images on the mm -hmm. outside of them as well. Um, oh, yeah, that's that, neat. Yeah, and so uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, they are guardian figures. That's where I got the idea for the name. Yeah, I like that. Oh, here's someone asking if I can write a list of all the recommended books that came up. You know what I do is um, tomorrow or the next day, I, I'll put a time stamps so you can go through and click on all the topics. And so whenever I, I'll, I'll say book, and then I'll have it. So it'll be in my time stamps. If, if that helps us, um, that's what I'll do. And do you, uh, 
yeah, as far as research, what, how was the research process for you? If you just want to tell us real quick, I mean, was there a certain? Was uh, it sure. There, uh, we we're fortunate in Detroit because the the main library in Detroit, which is one of the buildings featured in the book, yeah. also is home to the um, Burton Historical Collection, which oh. is this great collection of all kinds of material, newspaper clippings and everything uh, that was collected by Clarence Burton and then donated to the library. And it's all very well organized and you can, you know, the great librarians, very helpful people. Um, Wayne State University has a library uh, that I was able to use, the, the Bentley Library at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's the Ruther Library at Wayne State. Um, there's a church featured in the book, Historic Trinity Lutheran Church. They have uh, the Dow Library and that's spelled D-A-U. And it's a library of all the churches, uh, ephemera and materials from all the churches in the Detroit area. Oh, wow. So yeah, there's some great, great resources in the you Detroit really area. had some wonderful resources and you really made use of them in your book. Wonderful. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and, and then newspapers.com. And, oh and, yeah, isn't that great? I love all those news uh, online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different kinds of online newspaper sources. I'm going to look up the kidnapped alligator story on <laughs> some <laughs> newspaper articles. That sounds like a fun one. It was and in July of 1973. July of 73. Okay. Well, I guess I can look back and listen back. I'll just July of 73. I'll be looking for that. I'll post it. <laughs> okay. I really will let you go. This was wonderful. And I want to say thank everybody who came to the live and everybody who might be catching the replay and make sure that uh, you go by check out this book check out oops, if i click on the right button go make sure you check out this uh website and he also sells prints there uh photos i mean and yeah. i don't know um and um as well as the book and the coloring book um just this was really great i learned a lot and um everybody i guess we'll all see you next thursday and um thanks for coming jeff this was really fun i'll say really, goodbye to everybody it was my pleasure <laughs> bye everybody, everybody. Bye. <laughs>